I think we're ready to get started. Welcome to the final presentations of the students that are enrolled in the course, Stealing in Music City, USA, Solving the Problem of Music Piracy. We are very happy to have so many visitors attending our final presentation. In fact, we've had many visitors during the entire course, and we are very happy to welcome several of those back today, so thank you for being here. My name is Holling Smith-Born, and I co-teach this course with Sarah Manis. At the beginning of the semester, we started by having a brainstorming session on all of the possible stakeholders in the music piracy problem. We invited seven of those stakeholders to our class to come and speak about their perspectives and their concerns with music piracy. We were also fortunate to have David Mosher, the author of our textbook, come and speak to the course. Working in groups, the students have come up with possible solutions to the music piracy problem. Their plans account for the interests of all the stakeholders that we've talked about in class and outlines a possible solution for the music piracy problem. We are very thankful that we live in Music City. A course like this would not be able to be taught in this manner without living here in Nashville, Tennessee. We do have handouts that detail more about the course, who our guest speakers were for the course, and a little bit more about the final project which will be presented today in our groups. Each of our groups will have 15 minutes to present their final solutions, which will be followed by five, by five minutes of response and questions. And we have three groups today, and we're hoping to stay on track. Just a reminder to the students, Sarah will give you a sign when you're five minutes near the end of your presentation, and then again at the very end, so when your time is up. The students in this course are all first-year students here at Vanderbilt. For many of the students, this is the first time that they've seriously investigated music piracy and read about copyright law in regards to music. Sarah and I have really enjoyed teaching this class, and we hope that you find their, their ideas and solutions engaging and thought-provoking. So with that, I'll turn it over to our first group. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm Allie. Victoria. And this is our solution to uh, the music piracy problem. Our plan has three goals. The first is a reinvention of the music industry. Um, we have a couple points that would redesign some of the um, features in the music industry that seem to not be working in, in working out with digital technology. Um, we address three primary stakeholders in the music piracy debate, the artist, the label, and the consumer, and we work through some of the ways to find a balance between these three groups. Our third uh, goal of our plan is to have a secure future for the music industry um, through government involvement and education plan and cooperation from our three primary stakeholders. We started first with uh, the copyright definition. Um, the textbook we used went very in depth with all the copyright laws, and um, although it was clearly written and we tried our best to understand, we all identified that there were significant flaws with the way the copyright law is written right now. And we thought that a revision in this law would contribute to a better understanding by the artist, the consumer, and the label of some of the problems in music piracy right now. Um, some of the guest speakers in our class also agreed that there are flaws in the law and that a revision would help. Um, we would first like a clarification for who owns the copyright and in what situations. Um, confusion arises when a songwriter sells to the label or when an artist has the final recording and then who is entitled to use that and uh, who sees the money from it. So a clear law would help better allocate the money. Um, we read in a few sources that the DRM is significantly outdated um, and we would like a revision of that as well to help more people understand um, how music can be fairly listened to, what qualifies as fair use, and what is in the public domain. Um, our next idea for copyright law is through a licensing deal. Uh, we originally researched this on uh, this uh, wire.com website on an article written by David Byrne, um, where our solution was that the artist should retain the copyright of the master recording. Um, and David Byrne explains that the recorder suggested that the recording company should have the power to exploit the recording 
for a limited amount of time and then eventually the artist should have that power in the end. Okay, so a few ideas to restructure the record companies. Um, clearly the model isn't working and the companies are losing money. Um, Oftentimes, we don't consider the other people involved in the music industry that are losing their jobs because of it. It's not just the executives, but they're, they do have employees that they cannot afford to pay anymore because they're losing too much money. Um, and also, we wanted, we're looking into ways to cut unnecessary spending. Um, the same author, David Byrne, suggests that um, recording costs have been cut almost, can be cut almost to zero because people have more like ways to record their music. And also digital distribution can be free online. So those are two places that record companies invest a lot of money and there can be possible ways to cut that down. Um, we do recognize the significance of the record label simply because they um, can promote artists and really like get their names out there and support a developing artist, but maybe looking for ways that they can cut down some of their costs. Um, we, we all agree that the artist should have more power to decide how their career is handled and have more at stake with the record company. Um, as Maria mentioned, she kind of touched upon an artist and the label and how to equal that out. So the third part of it would be the consumer. And uh, we actually took this from a guest speaker, um, Mr. Bressman, and um, he had two ideas, which one of them was collective licensing, which is um, customers pay a certain amount of per, like, per month and it's unlimited songs. And if you kind of think about it, if you want to buy 20 songs on iTunes that are 99 cents, that totals to about $20. If you did the collective net licensing, that was about $9.99, and you bought 20 songs in that month, it, the cost is different than if you were to do it on iTunes. Um, also, uh, another idea that we see was increasing the number of online distributors. Most people don't like only having one place to go and one place to get their music. So by this, it's a competition for iTunes and other ways for people to get music rather than just one place and one place only. Um, there is a graph that kind of shows iTunes from the standpoint of iTunes and how the money is distributed. Um, for an album that's nine dollars and ninety-nine cents, about one dollar and forty cents goes to the artist, um, three dollars goes to iTunes, and five dollars and fifty-nine cents goes to the, the label. Um, so here's kind of a breakdown that shows um, the, reality, the reality of iTunes, um, how it's kind of favoring iTunes and it's not really equally distributed, and that um, it's not a perfect system, and there's definitely space for it to be fixed. Another part of our plan is to find an effective education plan, which will be key to cutting down the piracy problem. Uh, we believe it's the government's job to inform the people of the law and what is right and wrong when it comes to copyright law and that they should be informing the people as early as possible. So we think that in the public school system there should be uh, required computer education classes to teach them about copyright law and what they can and can't do. Um, and this should happen as early as possible in elementary school and it should also continue so that as we grow and we learn more we remember these laws and can pass them on to other people and educate each other. Um, we need to find a way to market this new plan either through, through the classes first and then also through public service announcements or pamphlets. Also, right now there's a lot of social pressure when it comes to piracy. Right now, um, a lot of kids are teaching each other how to download illegally and they sort of see it as this thing that's not bad, that's not illegal, that kids can do and we need to tip this and shift it to uh, people who do this are outsiders and that people are more educated and know they can't do this. Um, the RIAA has already tried to target uh, younger children um, in terms of educating them. They actually created these comic books, which we have a few slides from. Um, so here's part of it. The comic is actually pretty long. Here's part of it, just sort of a background. This girl here was taught by her friend to download illegally, and she ended up downloading uh, 2,000 songs and uh, one day when her grandma was out, a subpoena came to her door and uh, here she is holding the subpoena and she's worried her grandma's gonna be disappointed in her and she's gonna lose her scholarship. Uh, and so then the next slide uh, is actually when she is in court and um, she is convicted 
and she is given, she faces up to two years in jail and charged $25,000 in fines for the 2,000 songs that she downloaded. And this is a really extreme representation of what happens. Um, it's actually not entirely true because she's being charged as a criminal and in criminal copyright infringement cases, it's only the people who are actually selling pirated materials that are tried as criminals. Um, she was using peer-to-peer -peer, um, technology. So this is a little extreme, so a lot of people think the RIA is using scare tactics, which a lot of people look down on, but um, it could be effective to um, educate kids and get them to realize that it's about the law. Um, also, um, our plan isn't like completely, like there's places that there's weaknesses and room for improvement and everything, but um, it, this, what we decided is that our plan is not necessarily for everyone, and as you can see we have Brittany's um, for the record, which we kind of got the idea from her special. Um, we figured that for those that were created and built by the industry and that are making so much money aren't going to really care about whether they're um, receiving the same amount of funds that the label is getting because to them they're still making a huge profit. Um, our plan is for those artists that are really struggling and that are trying to make um, music and they're not really get, getting the benefits from it that they should. Um, also, this plan is not a definite solution. Um, music piracy is not going to stop and our plan is not a way to stop it completely. It's a way to minimize the problems that we have and try and find solutions for it before um, it can exceed and to find more ways of stopping it, so it's, it's only a beginning, really. Um, and then in Time Magazine, there was a quote that says, Can consumers be trusted to control their own music without pirating the record labels and the artists they produce right in the ground? Um, the answer is yes. It's just a matter of when the music industry will stop um, assuming its customers are all criminals. Um, with this, you can kind of see that um, many people's opinion is that you need to work with the consumer rather than constantly pressuring them and accusing them of doing, um, that everything they're doing is wrong. Um, the more you pressure and blame somebody, the less they're going to want to buy music from you or um, almost, it's, it's trying to find a way to work with the consumer rather than blaming them for everything and all the problems that they have. Um, so this way, the, our plan is kind of a way to fix that and equal everything out and stop the blame that's going around.
<laughs> we found it on a, on, it was like a Wired.com blog, and it had like pasted all the comic book like uh, entries or mm -hmm. articles. Mm -hmm. It was blasting it for pro propaganda and mm -hmm. different stuff like that, but we thought it could be an example of. I debated purchasing a couple copies, and as soon as I said, I'm like, oh, I don't think that quite hits the right tone. I don't think a lot of our <laughs>
Um, we want to. We want the program to support unsigned independent artists that still own all of the copyrights to their own music. And, and so we kind of created a rule that says, yes, an independent artist can set up their own page and advertise their own music and, and allow their music to be shared if they have a minimum of 12 songs. Because our, our logic for that was if it gets below 12 songs, the government physically can't handle tracking millions and millions of artists that just have one song out on the network. And that would just make it more complicated for paying those artists. So that's why we set the minimum for 12 songs if an independent artist did want to set up their own page and have their music shared and get paid for it. So basically, the government's setting up this blank slate for all these publishing companies to put up their music on, and they can you know, decide how they want to do it. But we think that this would be a good way to open up the internet medium for the music industry. Right. Here we have our hypothet hypothetical membership options of silver, gold, and platinum, where you would pay X amount of dollars per month and you would be able to share a certain amount of songs, up to a point where you'd be able to share an unlimited amount of songs. Now, the prices are hypothetical. They would revolve around the contracts that exist now and the current ways in which the companies are deciding how to distribute the money. Um, and when we look at prices, we were hoping to take the prices way down because A, we're getting rid of the middle band, like we said earlier with iTunes, but also that we're hoping to, by uh, shifting supply of music or increasing, you see this basic macroeconomic graph, we're sh we want to shift the supply curve to the right. We want to increase the amount of music that is shared that is out there in the world. And so we, our goal is to take the price of music down so an artist is getting less money for every time their song is shared but we hope that an artist is making more money because the frequency of sharing is, is increasing. And more, you know, the music industry, I don't know the percentage of people that illegally file share music, but like there's a lot of them out there, and if you're bringing more of those people in, you're going to increase the quantity, like she was saying, so, and so you can offer music for cheaper. And, um, and then in terms of getting paid, we've kind of been describing this, but what would happen is, Depending on who has the copyrights, you know, the government is going to break it down and look at how many times the song is shared, and then based on who owns the copyrights and based on the record contracts that were signed when the artist was first recording, the money will be divvied up between the actual recording artist and the record label based on the contract, but the money gets divided up between each song. And similar to how money is distributed based on radio play, <coughs> like a company such as Bug Music Tracks, how often a song is played, the program will track how often a song is transferred. So here's our basic structure where we start with the government committee, which organizes the network, followed by the individual company profiles, and then finally the consumer's access to each page. Um, and so just going back to what we were saying just a couple minutes ago, it all, in terms of people getting paid, it all depends on the individual contracts and who owns the copyrights um, to the music, but basically the government tracks how many times the song is being shared and let's say one month, you know, Britney Spears hit single Give Me More was shared a thousand times. The money, the, the government takes all the money in and kind of pools it and then at the end of the month, when they are able to break down how many times a song has been shared, the money is then sent out to each copyright owner. So, um, and then uh, music publishing companies and independent artists that have profile pages within the network um, can make their own money by selling advertisement slots on their page or just promoting other products that they might have or be a part of on their profile page when they are advertising their music that they have allowed to be on the network. Um, and this is just kind of a, a repeat, just a debrief again that the government is tracking and musicians will get paid every time, or whoever owns the copyright will get paid every time their song is shared. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. And then the unsigned artists, independent artists, if they have a minimum of 12 songs. Okay. Furthermore, the unsigned artists, too. they can unsigned artists can use the program as a tool to promote their music, with such functions as sorting the music by download frequency, 
and use a rating so we'll be able to promote these unsigned artists and give them the potential to be seen by big labels. We felt like it was one of the biggest advantages to the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing programs was its ability to get out new music. And with this uh, program, with people having this you know, larger access to music, they're going to be able to explore a little more into this new music and find new artists who can also then get signed with record labels. Um, so over the past, we found that there's been a trend for consumers to wanting the newest technology, especially when it comes to how they want to get their music, whether it's cassette players, CDs, or now digital files. They've always wanted to listen to music in a new and better way. And every time this happened, it's become easier and easier for them to copy it also. And now that we have the internet and digital copies, it's you know, infinitely easier to spread music and without you know, losing quality over time and all that. So instead of, but however, the industry, instead of giving consumers what they want, they've tried to attack them, trying to, all the RIAs, lawsuits, and all that. Uh, and not much progress has been made. And so we felt like ins instead we should give the consumers what they want. And we feel like this uh, solution is uh, utilizing all the new technologies that are out there that consumers want to use. It's uh, utilizing the most popular method of music distribution today, which is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, even though it's illegal. Uh, and it's a cheaper way for people to access music legally and we feel like consumers will buy into it because it's so much cheaper than paying a dollar a song, ten dollars an album on iTunes. So we increased the amount of people uh, paying into this program, and at the same time increasing the public's exposure to the art and ideas of music, uh, which is a definite benefit to society. Also, also it's a platform they're used to using. They're very familiar with the peer-to-peer programs, seeing as many of them have grown up using them. Also, we would hope that in the future, any sort of portable device that has a wireless connection would be able to access this network. And another uh, benefit we came up with was that slowly the government can be acquiring the library of uh, public domain music that's steadily increasing, and they can offer it outside of the subscribe limit or to unpaying guests on the network that can uh, have an easy way to access this uh, free music that they otherwise would have a hard time finding. And so then just as a final recap, we have a lot of faith in this solution that we've worked on because it's using the technology that's out there that people have shown that they love to use. It is making sure that everyone gets paid that needs to get paid so the music industry can thrive and people can afford to make music. And, and it's cheap. People can afford to do it. So um, we're really excited. <laughs> also, we would hope that by changing one generation's tendencies to acquire music, they would set an example for the upcoming generations on how to best acquire music as opposed to stealing. copyrights to these 12 songs that you have what you, know, you could submit your contract when you apply for the profile page. And it's it, it would just, you know, we wouldn't be, the network wouldn't be saying, oh, your music's not good enough, but we would, the only requirements would be that you did own the copyrights to your 12 songs and that, and that you were then legally uploading them and submitting the right to have them shared. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Have you thought of the name for the government committee? We've played around with it a couple times, but honestly, no, we just kept stopping over and over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe the subscription committee? I don't know. We liked the title because it was subscription solutions, two S's, and we were proud of that. Now we have to go over it. Do you think that coming up with the infrastructure and 
the software tracking that would be required and do you think that would be difficult? And how long do you think oh. it would take for this to be done? I don't think it would be that difficult because I think most of the technology is already there. With the peer to peer and the music tracking and I mean it is it's a matter of combining it. So and a, you know, a paying system similar to the way PayPal works in terms of money just being sold and redistributed. So immediately it's like something for if you were going to move forward with the solution, who would you approach? The government. Right, so well, obviously there would be, a, it would be an admittedly difficult process to I think it would, do that. I think it would take a lot of publicity in terms of writing letters to record labels saying, "Are you, do you, what would you think of this? Would you be open to putting your music on and getting paid like this? And then starting locally, just making local noise in terms of, you know, right, going to a town council and saying, hey, let's write a letter to the state legislator. And then, you know, if you can get, it, it's all just, if you think globally, act locally. So I think it would just be a matter of advertising it and, and catching some ground speed and getting the word out there and seeing if it could happen. Because a lot of it is a matter of people being willing to change. Which would definitely think. Any final questions? Thank you. You did a great job. We'll move on to our final group. If you will each introduce yourselves yeah, and make sure that you speak loudly so the camera can be This is our third group. I'm Corey Peake. I'm Rachel Hoagland. Jesse Miller. And I'm Ricky Taylor Jr. And this is our solution to the music piracy problem. Uh, before we get into our solution, we should talk about what is the problem to begin with. Uh, we'll define music piracy as the Ill illegal use and reproduction of intellectual property. In this case, it's music and all of the different sorts of uh, products that the artist can make. It would also be the um, album art and such. Uh, small infringements have always existed and will always exist so long as consumers have the freedom, and that's given by fair use. Uh, these small infringements don't cripple the music industry, though. Uh, it's such as like if you burn a CD for a friend or copy a tape, it's always been there. And this doesn't hurt the music industry. It takes sense of the roaring 90s, I call it. Uh, it was the best period for the music industry. And yet there was the most of this small infringement. So obviously that's not the problem. The real problem is the grand scale infringement. And this is occurring because of the internet. And the main, uh, the main villain here, I guess you could say, would be the peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, during the 90s, you can see that we had the best years for album sales. This is data from the RIA. But with the advent of Napster, which is just a scapegoat for the beginning of peer-to-peer -peer networking, we had drops. So, whose problem is it? The four more stakeholders we attributed to be artists and consumers. We have a third group, but mainly the artists need to be paid for their work. They're doing all the right, the songwriters also, they're doing the writing, they're creating the music, and they can't continue to do that line of work if they're not being paid for it. And consumers want to have fair access to music they want. They want to have cheap access. They're consumers. They're only going to exist so long as the artists exist, and their artists have to be paid to exist. So they're completely codependent. The third group would be the music label. And those are just getting the artists known and getting the products to the consumers. And in the future, they may not be as necessary and they may not be a primary stakeholder because it's easier for artists to get their products to the consumers and to get their names up. So our main two are artists and consumers. Whose responsibility is it? Similar to the past, the other two groups, we believe it's the government's responsibility to protect its creative population. The government needs to protect the artists that are creating the work, and other countries have gone more lax on these laws, and they've lost their creative output. So our solution is rooted in the legislator and action from the top, from Congress. We believe that once you reestablish the network and the, the business of music, then business models will develop that will offer the music from the artist to the consumers. So we're not proposing a collective licensing deal or a different sort of iTunes competitor, but we're going to fix the problem so the, the, uh, the market for music is established again. People are willing to pay me money for music, and then business models will emerge because it's profitable for them. So our solution is twofold, really threefold, but the temporary and immediate solution is the crippling of peer-to-peer -peer networks. We'll go into the specifics of how this will happen, but the peer-to-peer -peer networks were originally intended to transfer uh, data between businesses. And it was a very efficient at that, and it still is. But it's common knowledge that infringements occur on peer-to-peer -peer networks. So we're going to try to remove that. But we know that as you, you develop one business model, another will come up, and people will continue to steal music. 
So our primary solution is education. The other group stressed this also. We need to teach the students, we need to teach elementary school, middle school kids, teenagers, everybody, that music piracy is not just stealing, but it's stealing from people. There's an ethical problem there. Um, the funding for this education, the government will be leading the education uh, movement. The funding will be provided from the tax revenue because now the market is reestablished and people are buying music once again, and from a benefit concept that we'll go into a little more detail. This is lesson one. So I'm going to be talking about our plan to reform how music is transmitted over the internet. Um, as most of us know, if peer-to-peer -peer networks exist, they will be used for illegal activity. It's just too tempting to not use, to not use it for that. So with this plan, we would go back to the original intent of peer-to-peer -peer networks, which is to transmit like documents and various programs between, um, say, faculty at a university doing research on a project or employees at a company. Um, so any user, any users would need to register with a specific network to use peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer websites similar to the old Facebook. You would have, say, if a professor here at Vanderbilt University would want to share information over a peer-to-peer -peer network with a colleague, he would register with Vanderbilt, and Vanderbilt, in turn, would register with this peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, individual users could not, could not use peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, and in this way, the networks will take accountability for their users. Um, and in this way, um, everyone will sort of be pressured into only using peer-to-peer -peer networks for legal activity. Um, if, if a user registered with a certain network is using is sharing files illegally, then the network will be told that this is what their users are doing, and then the network can block that user from the from the software. And if the network doesn't comply with this, then the peer-to-peer um, -peer network will shut this down, and that will be the government's responsibility. It already takes illegal, website, illegal websites off the internet. It can do that with this also. And then our second part of the plan is to reform the levels of DRM protection. We would make it into a two-tiered um, plan. And of course, we can't come up with all the business models because if we reform uh, the levels of DRM protection, then the industry will change and evolve. And so these aren't permanent solutions or models, but they're beginning ideas. Um, basically, we want to make sure that user, that consumers can use their music to the fullest extent of the fair use laws and that artists and labels get compensated for their work. So first here of the plan is to um, provide music with lower costs but higher restrictions. This is similar to streaming music on Pandora Radio or Spiral Frog or TV shows or movies played on websites like Hulu. Um, you can do much with the music on your own, but you can listen to it or watch TV shows online, and it's paid for with, with advertisements during the music, or on the website, or during episodes of your favorite TV show. Um, the users have immediate access to the music they want, and it's all legal because it's paid for by advertising. And the second tier of this would be to provide slightly higher cost music with far fewer DRM restrictions. Um, that way, the, the users can get all of the use they can out of the fair use, can use the music to the fullest extent they can. And it's similar to the iTunes model, but it has, it doesn't keep the users from, doesn't keep the users from using it 
for personal use, say copying a CD for a friend or using it in a school project. And this show, this comic shows some of the frustrations that users would currently have with the music. They want to use their music for fair use and for personal use, but the current restrictions from the industry are taking away that personal right to use the music that they bought. Um, and, that, and the author of this uh, webcomic happens to be a big opponent of DRM restrictions. He's made several comics about it. Um, so right now consumers are sort of stuck because, as I say, it's currently a lose-lose situation for them. So the advantage of the new model is that with fewer DRM rules for music that users pay for <coughs> and more freedom to use the music as they want under fair use, the consumers are more likely to pay for the use of their music. Um, and also, this, would, this could make legal purchases available in more formats so that if you buy a CD, then you can put it onto iTunes, or if you buy something on iTunes, you can put it onto another format, because you bought the music, you should be able to use, you should be able to use it how you want. So, the consumers are allowed to use their music legally, and the uh, labels get compensated for their work. Okay, I'm going to be talking about, there's like two parts to our education, and I'm going to be talking about the part that would be happening more with like the government and the consumer. So, um, what our basic idea with educating the public, would, or like our, one, of the, one of the ideas, is that the government would, like a certain like law would be passed that like through the legislation, and they would um, like make some sort of precedent within the uh, public schools that like it would have to be part of the curriculum starting early that they would um, like have to educate the like starting elementary school about copyright laws and like the main thing behind this is it would be the ethics behind like what's wrong with taking like with stealing music not necessarily like every section and like component of copyright law at least initially in like more like elementary school middle school age kids and like a lot of almost every presenter that came in and like I guess even our class discussed as a whole that education like the general public doesn't really like I didn't really know I'll admit I used LimeWire before I came into this class I like I knew it was wrong but you don't really know who it affects and why okay so the um the law would be um, enforced would be more by like a state to state basis so like the states would come up with like their own way to well get so the funding behind this whole education system is kind of be in our next thing that Vicky's going to present, and um, so it's going to sort of be like a similar to the No Child Left Behind Act on a state to state basis of implementing it in the public schools. And the main focus would be on the um, the ethical problems involved in stealing music. So like. A lot, um, the, our book presented, like the book for this class presented a lot of different, it didn't just like, it wasn't just like the copyright law, like word for word, like interpreted like on one side and like all of it on the other side, like a lot of my history books did in high school with like laws and all, this, all that kind of stuff. But it would be more about like how, like it would give specific cases that were presented that like I didn't know about about how like you could, like certain things that like you can be allowed to do with like music that you have in like cases that have gone through and stuff like how like some music is like considered being stolen and how in some cases it's not. And then as they moved on to high school they would be presented more specific details. And that would hopefully move on through all the generations that passed through and they would be more educated about stealing music. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ricky Taylor Jr. and I will be presenting an educational concept our group came up with called Project Rock the Schools.
what is it? Well, fundamentally, it's a simple equation. Um, you have benefit concerts that are put on in multiple cities across the USA, and they're all aired on television, similar to the way Live Aid function. And you add to this funds raised from these concerts, and this equals money donated to schools in America to help incorporate basic intellectual copyright law education into their agendas. So what will happen at these concerts? Well, influential music artists that um, support the cause will perform. So maybe people like Brianna, Tim McGraw, Beyonce. <laughs> and then for your older generations, how about some U2 or Madonna or Steven Tyler? Uh, and then who else? Um, well, we have other speakers there as well. And there would be influential figures in our society, maybe celebrities such as Oprah, everybody thinks she's influential, uh, government officials such as maybe our newly elected President Barack Obama, uh, and then representatives from the RIAA could come, and they could um, share the nasty effects music piracy has had on the industry, such as $12.5 billion of economic losses every year and 71,060 jobs lost, and that information came from the RIAA's website. And also, we could have songwriters and musicians come in and share their stories, kind of like Professor Alice Randall and Professor Jen Gunderman did for us, because it opened a lot of our eyes and uh, it, it made us really see how it affected them. So how will the money be raised? Well, we would raise it from ticket sales to the concert, donations at the concert, uh, merchandise sold at the concert, such as CDs or um, clothing, um, iTunes, live iTunes tracks of the songs performed in music videos could be sold on iTunes and then that money could go towards the calls as well. And then call-ins from home for the people who decide to stay home and watch it on TV. Uh, the big problem with this though is where will the money come from to put on such a large scale concert series? And this is where we really need the help from a lot of the different stakeholders such as the record labels, the RIAA, music artists, government, and celebrities, and if they can all come together to, as one group and try to like stop it, it would be more effective than individually. Um, and this is an evolving event. It involves music artists, influential individuals, uh, such as the government. Uh, it also involves songwriters and musicians, uh, record labels, the RIAA, iTunes, and of course, the consumers. Will this end music piracy? No. <laughs> but it will educate current generations on effects music piracy has on the industry. But more importantly, it will raise money to donate to schools in America about the so that um, they could sorry donate to schools in America to help educate future generations about this issue and hopefully um, decrease music piracy in the future. Um, education is the solution. That's it. Are there any questions for this group? From anyone? <laughs> Do you think it will be difficult to uh, get people to agree to register PTP on networks? They will have to. <laughs> um, I mean, do you think is... that it's going to be, I mean, assuming it's legislated, you're going to mm -hmm. have people that are going to definitely be against that. How, how difficult? The government currently deletes other illegal sorts of websites, say, mm -hmm. just with inappropriate content. This would be another one of these. And this would also circumvent or go back to the original intent of it and not really circumvent it like Napster did. Napster got around all the laws by doing by not using a centralized server so that they couldn't claim any knowledge of illegal activity. All of these peer-to-peer -peer sites would be centralized so that there's a moderating brain that can tell when there's illegal activity happening. So the idea is that the 
the peer-to-peer -peer networks would be holding their users accountable. People couldn't just freely go onto it, use what they want, and then get away without a trace. Um, only businesses or registered individuals, and then you can track those individuals. So people can't just go on using illegal things or getting away with it. So. Yes. Would that then be placing like the burden of enforcing that on the business or the, or the university or whatever? Or on the, the people who register into it? Yeah. Like That's, if they're if like Vanderbilt's users were violating the law, who would, would they be responsible for their registered users? Well that would depend on the business and how they would handle it, but it would also incorporate the law as well. So for it's instance, a yeah, because I mean if it was a school then like they could easily take away their access to it or other punishment okay. within the school boundaries as well. But there would also be laws against that. Sure. Yes, comment. Uh, there's an interesting new business book out right now called The Spider and Starfish. And I can't remember the, the authors of the book, but it, it talks about uh, why peer to peer is so hard to stand out and to get under government control. And it goes back and talks about how Napster was a situation where peer to peer had to pass through a one final. Now that's not possible. And, and it talks about the fact that uh, why it's been so hard for the industry to try to ever get this under control because it's disorganized and decentralized to the point that one little piece of it, if you leave one little piece, it grows into something new. It's a very interesting book that I just became aware of within the last month or so, but it relates to a lot of what you talked about in this class. So we see the biggest problem right now is that the government can't act on it. The current laws can't, you can't prosecute those businesses or the <coughs> programs that people have exposed. So we want to give more freedom to um, track those down and control them. And then also, um, you mentioned that it's just to the point to where we can't do that anymore, and it needs to come to the point to where we can. There needs to be more regulation on it. That's one of the major issues is that there's so much deregulation on it that nothing can be done if we regulate it more and get it to the point to where we can get it functioning, then we, we gotta act. Well, I, I think you all did very well, and I think you've given us some interesting things to think about. Uh, we will be having class next week, but it will be very informal. We just sort of want to debrief and see what your experience is in that. And Holly and I will be bringing food, so we'll just sit and wash a lot. So our guests are welcome again. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you.